Hello and good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning to our speaker for the day, uh, Professor Muzaffar. Uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture of the IPN lecture series uh, focused on publishing and uh, writing. Uh, today we have Professor uh, Muzaffar Ali Malla, Assistant Professor in the Department of uh, Philosophy, Savitri Bhai Pune, Pune University in Pune. Uh, he, uh, Professor uh, Muzaffar, uh, received his MPhil and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And prior to joining uh, Savitri Bhai Pune, Pune University, he taught philosophy at uh, Hindu College at uh, University of Delhi. He specializes in the areas of uh, social and political philosophy and contemporary Indian philosophy with an emphasis on the idea of the public sphere and its normative implications in the Indian context. Uh, importantly, uh, he has his book coming out uh, anytime soon, Muzaffar, yeah, titled uh, uh, India Habermas and the Normative Structure of the Public Sphere, uh, which also brings us to the topic of today's talk, uh, which is titled uh, From a Thesis to a Treatise, Some Reflections on uh, this book, where uh, Professor Muzaffar would uh, begin by outlining the central arguments of the book and more importantly, talking us through uh, the writing process of uh, specifically how did he go about uh, uh, working on his thesis to make it a treatise, a book. So uh, welcome and thank you, Professor Muzaffar Ali, for uh, joining us and delivering this lecture for us. Over to you. Uh, before that, just a brief about the structure. Maybe I think Professor Muzaffar would give his talk for half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll have uh, questions and discussions from the audience. Over to you, Muzaffar. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you, Sushrut uh, and uh, Varun as well for uh, giving me this opportunity. So I'm here because this book is coming. Otherwise, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified enough to speak on how, how to publish. So I'll share some uh, of the aspects that went into turning a thesis that I had uh, written on Habermas into this book that is now uh, coming out uh, from Rotledge uh, uh, in May. So uh, as uh, Siddharth mentioned, the book is titled India, Habermas and the Normative Structure of uh, Public Sphere. My thesis was titled differently. The title of my thesis was Understanding Indian Public Sphere Through a Critique of Jürgen Habermas. So uh, uh, before I go into the process of uh, publication and how, uh, how the book uh, uh, was given shape, I will just not go into the arguments. I'll just pinpoint what I am trying to do in this book. So... I'll, I'll not go into this uh, the arguments at all. I'm not going to say that this is the argument, that is the argument, no counter arguments. I'm just going to put forward some four or five points and then we'll, we'll go into the process itself. So uh, mainly the book talks about normal uh, normative Indian political theory and the predicament that, 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 that surrounds it. The predicament of normative Indian political theory and how uh, Indian political theory and contemporary Indian philosophy, they become two like sisterly disciplines. If they can speak to each other or come forward and uh, create a uh, collaborative space, so maybe this predicament can be adequately responded to. That's what I uh, do in this book. Then, and uh, I think I have to say the second point, mention the second point with a huge caution. because there is enormous uh, scholarship available on Habermas. And it is entirely possible that even Habermas himself might not be knowing uh, about uh, the entirety or the uh, like uh, volume of this uh, scholarship. So, but as far as my reading goes, I couldn't find even a single uh, essay, journal article, or even a book which deals with the evolution of Habermas's thought on public sphere. So Habermas starts writing on public sphere in the 1960s and it goes on till uh, uh, like it's continuing till now, 21st century. But what I figured is that most of the journal articles, they either deal with the bourgeois public sphere or then they deal with the uh, uh, communicative rationality or then they deal with uh, the role of religion within public sphere. 
no one had in my opinion or uh, as far as my uh, reading goes try to offer a holistic view of this evolution so i try to do this one chapter is essentially meant for this and i don't know whether i am the uh, one to do it for the first time or whether someone has done it earlier and i don't know uh, so uh, then uh, in this book also i try to uh, uh, do a very uh, like uh, thick reading of the existing engagements that Indian scholars, maybe political theorists, historians, and social science scholars have already done with Habermas. And I try to figure out their limitations so that I can gain some ground to move beyond them, to move past the limitations of their engagements. That's that's uh, like step by step how I go into this book. And then I conceptualize what contemporary Indian situation is. And based on that concept, con uh, conceptualized Indian contemporary situation, I interrogate Habermas and come up not with a conclusion, with an argument that as far as Habermas's thesis of public sphere is concerned, it may not be helpful to uh, study or to philosophically theorize an Indian theory of public sphere. And then I go ahead and figure out how, what the normative structure of an Indian public sphere can be by coming up with uh, uh, excavated notion of rationality that I label as the universal rationality. And that's what the book is about. Uh, that's the alternative. So, but since it was earlier a thesis and I uh, upgraded or I worked on this thesis to uh, uh, get it published as a book, and as you can see in the abstract, uh, there are two uh, important aspects that we need to uh, take into consideration if we cons uh, if we think that um, our thesis needs to be published as a book or needs to come out as a book. First is the technical aspects, and second is the academic aspects. I'll first deal with the technical aspects. The first technical aspect, although no need to mention it, uh, mention it is the quality of work because. I'm not saying that uh, thesis, PhD, we write PhD thesis of low quality. I have no one to judge. But by quality of work, I mean that we are the better judges to figure out whether the thesis could suit journal articles better or whether the thesis can uh, be suited best for a holistic argument that is only possible for one to make in a book. Like you cannot write journal articles and like say that um, uh, I am first published in JSCPR and then I am taking from JSCPR and pu publishing in SOFIA. Then from SOFIA, you go to EPW. That, that will ruin the entire process. So it depends whether your work is like you are the better judge. The, 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 the candidate is the better judge to figure out whether the thesis needs to be published as a book or can go for multiple journal articles as and when the need arises. Now, there is a very, like, we are all part and parcel of a huge bureaucratic system. And I need to mention this, that it is here that we also need to take into consideration uh, the dilemma that we as young scholars are facing right now, because the entire system is dominated by science. And there's a crisis in the current higher education bureaucracy where journal articles are given more weightage than books. A book is not even making a young scholar like us eligible for cash promotions right now. So it is only like you have to write one article, then you go from grade one to grade two, then you write three articles, then you go from grade two to three, then you again write three articles. Even if you write a book, it fetches you some points, but the basic eligibility is not covered. So it's like... Uh, 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 like if I can use the term, a moral dilemma, whether we want to stand with the system or whether we want to stand, stand with the discipline. Because a book is quite necessary for social sciences and humanities. Like it's, it's quite, if anyone among us wants to come up with a very uh, peculiar intervention, inter interesting invention, I think more than journal articles, a book matters, but the system is completely against that. So we need to take it into consideration before thinking whether uh, we want to write a book or whether we want to go ahead with the system or public journal articles, no matter whether the impact is there or not. So that's another thing. So once we are done uh, and dusted with this exercise, then begins 
the reach out to publishers. Okay, and it is important to uh, take into consideration that we choose the right publisher. So, if I give some example, for example, if someone among us is working on classical Indian philosophy, then Motilal Banarasi Das is the proper person. Then even DK uh, top proper publisher. Then even DK Print World may be the proper publisher. Okay, uh, uh, within India, and if we are working in uh, some other domains and try to figure out some global publishers, then I think right now there are two good options within India um, uh, as of now. Uh, uh, one is uh, Rotledge and another is Oxford. Sage, I think, has already wound up its book business within India as far as I know. So it's like once we are clear with uh, the scope of the book and we are done uh, with uh, figuring out the right publisher, so it is time that we reach out to, to the publisher through a proper channel. So usually most of these publishers have contact IDs on their websites. They have senior editors. So you reach out, we reach out to a proper senior editor or an editor and figure out, pitch the idea of the book, a brief uh, abstract kind of a thing. And uh, usually most often they respond back because this is just an abstract and they are interested in book proposals. So you will get uh, that you uh, you will get a mail or you will get a response from them that you uh, send us a book proposal. Also, with the book proposal, you have to submit a manuscript. Okay, and it is necessary that uh, even though with senior authors they they only take book proposals, but with uh, lower mortals like us, so they they even uh, sometimes. Uh, ask us to submit 100%. Sometimes they'll say that at least 90% of the work should be there. And this is a very tedious process because the book proposals are not only academic. They ask you, uh, they ask you fill in details about the market value of the book. They ask you to fill in details about what is it that you are adding to the scholarship. They ask you to uh, write things about uh, um, uh, some previous works that are done in the area, some current works that are done in the area. So it's a, it's a, it's a hell lot of complex exercise because the book proposals are usually, I guess, nine pages long, 10 pages long. So in the, in that, in those book proposals, you have to give the synopsis of the book. You have to give chapter wise abstracts. You have to give them, uh, uh, some, uh, other uh, statements regarding the book, how this book is, uh, uh, going to be pitched, et cetera, et cetera. And with once you are ready with that, once we are ready with that, we send them the manuscript. So I think for like junior people like us, they don't accept usually less than 80% of work. They don't take it. And in that uh, uh, book proposal, uh, uh, there's a section where they also ask you to um, give the names of potential reviewers. But it is their uh, discretion whether they send uh, the manuscript to that reviewer or not. So usually they go to, uh, ahead with some two reviewers and uh, they take their own sweet time once we submit. And uh, after the review report comes, you receive a mail, either it's a yes, or it's a yes with certain conditions, or it's a no. Th these are the three ma main options. So once you receive, so usually with the junior authors like us, it will be yes with conditions, isn't it? And the conditions are they are marked in huge uh, review reports that these and these are the issues that have been marked. But uh, we are interested in your work. Then uh, they first go for con contract signing. So contract is legal foundation that it's it's uh, legally binding now that uh, the the author, the prospective author, is going to submit the entire manuscript uh, uh, in a, in, in, a due, in due course of time. So when the contract is signed, so they take uh, all details and they usually give six months from the date of uh, signing of contract for you to review your work, redo your work. And uh, after six months, once we are uh, done with the rework, once we are done with making those updates and uh, uh, taking into account the reviewers' comments and uh, other stuff, we submit it back to the editor who has been assigned to the work. After that, it takes a few months. Yeah, yeah, Varun. 
Uh, Muzaffar, a quick doubt. How much time they take to get back to you after you submit the proposal? It, it, it depends on uh, uh, maybe the peculiarity of your work. So uh, I think Oxford usually takes a year. Same is the case with Rotledge. They usually take around a year, like Mota Mota. It can be six months. It can be seven months. It can even be a year. Whoa, okay, long time. Because right? because uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll just say something on, because reviewing is a thankless job, isn't it? I don't know how much it's, I think Rotlich pays some 2000 rupees to the reviewers. So usually these reviewers are senior professors. They don't bother about 2000. So they also do this reviewing work in their own uh, like sweet zones, isn't it? True, true. Yeah, yeah. So it depends on like, I guess it's sheer luck. It depends on whom it goes to. If the person is super busy, so he is definitely going to take time. And none of these things goes to juniors, isn't it? None of these things comes to us. Otherwise, we are sitting idle and we would be more than happy to do it uh, within months. But since they have their own ways of doing it, so uh, it takes time. So in my case, I think they took seven months. Shall I go ahead? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks, Muzaffar. Yeah. So um, once once we submit the entire manuscript, uh, now like uh, we fulfill the um, uh, le uh, like legal bond in the name of contract. So it takes uh, the publisher a few months, and suddenly uh, you get a mail not from the editor, but the agency that has been hired to do the production of your book that's how usually uh, these publication houses do uh, do this exercise so you receive uh, a mail that the copy editing process has started and uh, quite interestingly when we submit this uh, manuscript finally when we submit this manuscript we have to submit some forms and one of the interesting forms that is essential for us philosophers is that uh, like uh, what is the style that you want to follow what is the spelling style that you want to follow those technical things and in those technical things the essential element is that which are the peculiar spellings that you want to continue irrespective of the style like for example we turn mode into modality isn't it we, we are using uh, some some uh, like uh, phantasmagoric terms uh, philosophers use so we have to mention them so that the copy editor who is just an english proofreader he doesn't mark them off. So, but even then the copy editor sometimes marks uh, certain uh, uh, things as errors. So when the copy editor receives the copy and he copy edits, so it's a thorough process, then we receive all the files, like all the chapters again, from uh, acknowledgements till bibliography with a hell lot of comments from the copy editor that I'm not clear with this. Do you want to continue with that? Do you want to continue with this? But interestingly, this is the last space available to the author to minimally enhance the text if he or she wants to, because there is scope. It is still in a, as document. It's not typeset yet. So here, if during those three months, the author has gone through the text and figured out that some things need to be ironed out, some ambiguities need to be removed. So this is the last time for the author to remove those ambiguities and uh, uh, figure out whether the consistency of the style has been followed, whether grammatical errors have been uh, um, uh, looked up to, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think uh, usually the publisher, because they are already into production and they are paying the company, they usually, since it's, a, it's all, um, uh, uh, dominated by capitalism, they they force the author that you finish it as soon as possible. But I think, as as serious authors, we need to bargain with them that since it's it's an uh, important exercise in the book, uh, so give me some time, give me at least a month so that I can figure out what the copy editor uh, has done and what are the queries that he or she has raised, so that we can respond properly to them. So no matter who the publisher is, but usually publishers. They, 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 they stress that uh, we have to do it as soon as possible. So once we are done with uh, the copy editing part, the copy editors comments, the, the, the queries uh, we have received, or we have ironed out some differences, okay? We send these files back to the 
uh, agency that has been hired. And uh, you, you then uh, write to them that I have resolved all your queries, I have responded to all your queries, kindly go ahead. So once we submit, then after I guess uh, 15 days or 20 days, we receive the final typeset proofs. So typesetting is that they give it now the book form. So the typeset and uh, the first proofs are the last contact between the agency and uh, the author usually. And here, interestingly, no important change can be made now. Like, jo ho gaya, jo ho gaya, so ho gaya. It is only some minor corrections, maybe spelling may mistake kisi jaga reh gaya hai. Maybe koi technical punctuation mark reh gaya hai. That's all we can do now because they, they usually write to you in bold letters that you cannot change because it will alter pagination. It has been already paginated. So they do it both online as well as offline. So I don't know. It depends on publishers. So once you go through the text again, you take your own 10 days or 20 days, you send it back and you are done. The author is done. And after that, they send it to the print and uh, uh, press and the book is uh, then in the final stage of production and first, uh, depending on the publisher, they publish an uh, ebook copy and uh, then a global edition. And after that, I think it takes two months or three months, depending on how much work they are doing. So this is the technical part of uh, the entire exercise, depending on my experience. Then the second interesting part is the academic one, because uh, a thesis remains an unpublished document. And uh, if we go uh, with the 2018 UGC letter on plagiarism or self-plagiarism, so any, anybody among us can pick up a chapter or part of a thesis and publish it as, as it is, as a, a journal article or as a book. Okay, But sometimes uh, we need to fine tune. We need to alter because most often we write theses uh, in very peculiar styles. And uh, usually there is a very time-tested framework of writing a book. Usually most books, I guess 99% of books start with a preface and end with a conclusion. But that's not how theses are. Uh, different institutions follow different patterns. Different institutions follow different ways of writing theses. So it depends on how your thesis has been written to determine how much work we have to do in order to carve a book out of a thesis. So I'll give an example of my thesis. Since my thesis was titled Understanding Indian Public Sphere through a Critique of uh, Jürgen Habermas. So uh, the first chapter there, since uh, my supervisor thought that we needed, was not uh, uh, something which could have become part of this book. So I had to remove entirely the first chapter that was part of my thesis because the first chapter there uh, meant to uh, uh, figure out and analyze the Western roots of Habermas, okay? Which uh, from a book's perspective is not something that we'd want to do because we all know that Habermas is a Western thinker. We all know that he's a German Frankfurt scholar, Frankfurt school scholar. So on the other hand, since my focus was completely on Indian public sphere, it was essential to figure out how normative Indian political theory um, can be done as far as the theorization of Indian public sphere is concerned. So rather than that chapter, I added this completely new chapter, which is like Indian uh, political theory and search for the uh, public sphere. This was not there in my thesis. Uh, secondly, uh, there was an upgradation of almost every chapter. In, uh, in second chapter, I, I tried to figure out uh, how the shift from Habermas's bourgeois public sphere to communicative public sphere takes place uh, through Husserl and uh, through, um, uh, through some other thinkers, although I focused on Edmund Husserl. This was not part of my uh, thesis plan. Uh, in the Indian engagement chapter, I added more material to make it more contemporary so that so that it would not sound that I, I'm just doing this exercise in passing. So I at least, uh, so this was, uh, that was not a chapter, that was a section earlier in my thesis 
so this became a chapter and uh, at least in both camps i uh, i call them comparative camps and evaluative com camps i added one or two uh, uh, new thinkers who had whom i wasn't able to read during my uh, days of thesis so similarly in chapter 4 chapter 5 and what is interesting here is that uh, while we sharpen the arguments academically in philosophy because we are all uh, at least um, i i i presume it dealing with philosophy in in philosophy there is usually a baggage that comes with terms or concepts that we use so um, um, uh, essentially because uh, one philosopher uses the same concept and gives it a different persona gives it gives it a different meaning and a completely different tradition and different philosopher uses the same thing in a different way for example substance isn't it uh, practical rationality uh, so i had used the term practical rationality in my thesis but while working on it uh, as a book i figured that if i use practical rationality the reader might get confused so i had to figure out a completely new term which is uh, de universal rationality but since i cannot just i am too uh, small uh, a scholar to come up with completely new terms and throw new terms into the already existing discourse so i had to figure out how to ground the universal uh, rationality and that i did by going into some uh, tertiary literature uh, where d had been used before so like i grounded this uh, this term so that i get rid of the baggage that maybe concepts that i have earlier used they work in in a thesis because in a thesis they can work but since your book is now going to a uh, wider audience so we have to take those into account so some concepts need to be what i can say fine tuned reconfigured so that uh, the uh, essence of writing a book uh, remains uh, alive and that's it i think we can we can now talk and have a have a kind of dialogue that's it these are the important academic things that we need to take into account thank you uh thank you muzaffar thank you for that uh, it was very very interesting listening to you uh so we can the floor is open for questions and people can uh ask any questions even if it's slightly specific to their own interests and they'd like to hear the uh, speaker respond to that uh so yeah questions yeah let me begin with uh one yeah. since i don't uh i was wondering what is the policy if you already have journal articles from your thesis let's say you already a couple of chapters have already been published as uh, articles in journals so uh, do you have to get permission from the journals or uh, is it generally not a good idea how does that work the, the uh, this this is a very because most of us suffer suffer uh, suffer this isn't it so usually this uh, letter by ugc uh, clearly mentions that you cannot reproduce your published work without acknowledgement mm -hmm. so if we uh, reproduce uh, some uh, of our uh, already existing published work uh, and uh, try to uh, put it as new work so we are self plagiarizing that's what ugc says and if we even try to acknowledge and Uh, copy ditto it goes into edited work not authored work then so it has to be changed completely it has to be unpublished work oh because so, but, we cannot uh, we cannot acknowledge that this particular chapter exists already somewhere else mm -hmm. and put it again as a new chapter we can refer to it maybe but okay. i don't think we can ditto uh, like copy it again because I, i i don't think whether i have that letter let let me see somebody had sent it to me a few days back i hope it's with me and i i'll read a bit from that letter because that's we are all bound by ugc isn't it so just just give me a minute yes Yeah. 
Please give me a minute because I remember okay. receiving it just a few days back. Okay. No worries. I, I was also more interested from what do the publishers say? For example, does Rutledge say that none of these uh, chapters must have been published or no part must they have been published? They usually take an undertaking, okay. undertaking from you. Okay. They 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 get it. Uh, it's part of the contract that this is new work and uh, all those things are written there. Uh, so you'll have to edit it significantly. Significantly. It has already been published. So I, have, I have found this... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share it so that somebody can put it in the chat box. I'll share it with Siddharth. You're on mute, Siddharth. Muzaffar, if you can put it in the chat box yourself, that should be fine. But it's on my phone. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you just mail it to me? I'll do that. Yeah, I, I have mailed it to you. Have you got it? <laughs> I'm just checking. So this is not, uh, unfortunately, it's not 2018. This is a letter from UGC in 2020. Okay. On self plagiarism. No, because I had seen a couple of, uh, you know, books where the author has said parts of this chapter were published in this particular journal, uh, parts of this, uh, you know, chapter. So I was just wondering what is the. What Usually is... people do this, but. Since we are already working in institutions, uh -huh. like I even know some authors whose works I have read. So like uh -huh. it's completely in between. You figure out that I read it in that book. But right. since they are so, so big people, I think most people don't consider it. But with us, it may be problematic. Uh -huh. All right. Thanks. It depends. It depends on who we are. Isn't it? Uh -huh. Unfortunately, that is the case. Like with us, even if it is very minor thing, like usually they'll uh, like go after us, isn't it? Come after us. Yeah, Varun. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, let me uh, start from uh, what Shushut asked. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, it might be the case in analytical philosophy or like say philosophy of science specific uh, where I have seen, um, like say, if the book has a five chapters, um, three chapters are completely already published in one of the journals and permission is required from that journal whether we can publish it as a part of the book. So uh, at least I have seen several uh, instances of that. And um, now the clarification I wanted is that, like say, uh, are you saying the UGC is saying that we can't publish it as a thesis or having published it as thesis and posted it on Shodh Ganga, then we can't publish it as a book? No, no, no. Thesis is completely unpublished, even if it is available on Shodh Ganga. Thesis is an unpublished document. Correct. Yeah, that is what I was getting confused. So what is UGC is pointing out? UGC's point of view is that if you have already published something, uh -huh. you cannot reproduce it as new work. Ah. That is the letter we have shared. I am not an authority on this, but that, <laughs> that's the sense that it gives. Hmm. Okay, so they are saying that if someone has already published a work, hmm. okay, you cannot reproduce it as new work. Hmm. Yeah. So since we are lesser mortals, isn't it? So all of us may be lesser mortals here. So if we do this, like even get permission, so maybe they'll say that since you have already published these three chapters everywhere, you have already milked them for cash. <laughs> Isn't it? So we won't consider this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably, I mean, like, uh, I mean, uh, I can't take three papers and make it into a book. Probably in the book should have something more than that. So that's what I'm saying. So they'll say that since only two chapters are new, if, mm. if for book you get 12 marks, so we'll divide it by five chapters. You have five chapters. That, that's how things go on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I'll just share an example. I have, I have a friend here who is a professor. He happened to just go to some university, I'll not name it, for cash promotions for from assistant professorship to associate professorship. So he told me that uh, uh, I couldn't help. I said, why couldn't you help? He said that the person who was there for the interview, the candidate, he had published in very reputed journals, Taylor and Francis, Supringer, etc. But the vice chancellor, because that's usually what matters, isn't it? The administration of the university 
they were more focused on a Scopus publication. They said that you don't have a Scopus publication, so we will we'll not give you a CAS. <laughs> Even though he was fulfilling all necessary requirements. Mm -hmm. True, true. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, better, better, better be cautious than. Yeah. Correct, correct. And for promotion and uh, how the, I mean, it's also sad that like, say, sometimes in certain, like, say, for example, it may not be the case with state universities or certain uh, central universities in that sense. But I know certain institutes where, where the publication of a paper and publication of a book is considered given equal weightage, which is so sad because like in a book, you do a lot more work than a paper in that sense. But that's what that's what I said. That now UGC is saying that even if you publish a book, you are not eligible for CAS. For CAS, you have to publish journal journal articles only. Correct, correct. Yeah. So you'll get twelve marks for a book. You get ten marks for a for a for a journal article, isn't it? So you if you need thirty uh, marks, uh, thirty points. So three journal articles. Mm. Even if you have four books and you are a reputed scholar of the world, I don't think the system allows that. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. That, that that's the sad part hmm. yeah also i had uh, i mean since you brought it up now i'll shift my question or should that should i ask my question later and others ask can i continue asking no do continue uh, uh because i don't see any other questions for now but so do continue so uh, since you uh, also mentioned and since we are now talking about book versus papers um one of the things is that uh, I completely agree with your initial point that like say we are the better judge of whether it should be made into a book or whether it should be converted, the chapter should be converted into each of a, uh, each paper in that sense, like send it to a journal for peer review and all of that. What uh, one of the comments that I got was uh, uh, See, I, my thesis was already uh, like had like say four chapters, four chapters were published in that sense as individual papers. One of the uh, reviewers mentioned that like, why don't you convert this into a book? Now, um, of course, now the question is that like what new I will get by going through this whole process of rewriting all the chapters and everything so that it, see the thing is we can't just paste four papers and make it into a book. A lot more work needs to be done. So the, the process of converting papers into a book is much more laborious. And that is not what I'm where I'm going towards. What I'm asking is that, like, I mean, I'm just throwing open the question to you and to the audience here. That is there that like, is whether a book is published or a paper is published, which is more, uh, which is the mode of communication for an academic. Is I think also decided by the subdiscipline. Of course, we know the science hegemony and how mm -hmm. uh, the given that we are in the science paradigm in the universities and everything, where papers are considered more uh, what you say has more weightage than the book. That is what also you, you mentioned in your initial part. Having acknowledged all of those, now when we situate ourselves in philosophy and various subdisciplines of philosophy, let it like say political philosophy, ethics, and philosophy of science, metaphysics, and all of that, Indian philosophy. I think each of our uh, subdiscipline is differently structured, um, which demands certain communications from the scholars to get established in that field, a certain form of communication. And that is where I, I think, uh, I mean, I since I belong to philosophy of science, it is I see, and also largely analytical philosophy, it's it's the papers which becomes the mode of communication. Mm -hmm. And um, and not the books. And what I've also seen, okay, this is just an observation, and you can say whether it's same for political philosophy or not. That is the comment that I wanted. But what also I have started noticing is that um, certain sub-disciplines uh, are so already super specialized that for each subdisciplines ka theme in philosophy of science, there are several subdisciplines, subtopics, right? For each of that, there is a specific journal. Like say, for example, if you're just focusing on theory and observation, this is a journal for that. If you're focusing on history of philosophy of science, there is a specific journal for that. If you're working on biology, history of uh, science of biology, philosophy of biology, then there's a specific journal for that. 
This also shows the fragmentation within a subdiscipline where there is specific journals mapped to that. And um, I haven't seen this being replicated. Probably it is there for ethics, but I don't know about philo political philosophy. Since your work seems to be situated in political philosophy, was that also playing in your mind that, let's like, say, there may not be super specialized journals in which I can publish each chapter. Let me consolidate all of them, give a holistic view and holistic larger argument and publish it as a book. So yeah, some thoughts. Yeah, yeah see, uh, this is this is quite interesting, isn't it? Like, because uh, uh, somehow uh, it, it's, it also depends. That's why I began with this, that we are the better judge whether our discipline demands more uh, journalist uh, journal oriented writing or book oriented writing so for example if i give the example of political philosophy and it depends on what within political philosophy we are doing or social and political philosophy we are doing so when during the la larger part of 20th century political philosophy was considered dead it was only john rawls uh, a theory of justice which resurrected it it was again a book and in my opinion, like, um, again, uh, no one to be uh, considered as an authority. Uh, for social sciences and humanities, if anyone has to bring out some important intervention, it's only through a book rather than journal articles, even if there are very specific journal articles, because it is it even we, even, we don't consider it good to publish continuously in just one journal, isn't it? It becomes problematic for us because then people will think that iska koi link hai udhar. Isi link <laughs> continuously ek hi journal mein publish kar raha hai. So uh, that's how I think about it. That a book is a very important medium for at least social sciences and humanities. Uh, number two. Uh, so even when we go with journal articles, okay, in social sciences and humanities there are very fuzzy and uh, very self-proclaimed, um, uh, sorry to say this word, disciplinary boundaries. I'll give, a, I'll give again an example from my experience. Okay, so I have an article on the concept of public and private. So I sent it to a journal uh, uh, which is published by Taylor and Francis. Okay, so they took it, took three months. And after three months, I received the comments that this is more sociological. Okay, so... These are the following journals. Please send it to them because they deal with it. So somebody considers whether it is sociological or not. So you cannot even argue that uh, how how do you how do you delineate or how do you adjudicate that this is more sociological, so it should go to a sociology journal or it is more uh, political uh, theory wala, so it should go to a political theory journal. So as a chal hai journals mein, that they tell you that we think that it is. So it may, it, so I then decided that I'll not send it to a sociology journal because it may be the case that when I send it to a sociology journal, they'll say that it's more philosophy oriented. And <laughs> it doesn't fit our scope, isn't it? And we usually like these articles become like a football, uh, uh, where even journals sometimes are unable to figure out whether they should be publishing or it or not. I'm talking about political philosophy, not about other disciplines. Uh, makes sense, uh, Muzaffar, and that is what I, I was also thinking. Uh, uh, and I think books, publishing of books provides that kind of a, uh, escape route for not falling into any of these traps. Yeah, it it, it, it pro at about. least provides a space for the author to not only widen uh, his ambit of work, but at least carve it as a holistic argument and produce it in front of the audience and then let the readers decide what to do with it or what to, what not to do with it and i think that is essential for social science and humanities but unfortunately the system is against it mm -hmm. so it's like ye malum nahi ki uh, maine ye book publish karke aapne pairon pe kulhadi mara ki nahi mara i don't know yeah 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 isn't and it also, i mean i think i mean i might be completely wrong here in still uh, uh, books have a lot of traction and this is see, the thing is that I think it is the huge debate not only with sciences I think even within philosophy like say for example I, I, I have been taught by a faculty whose main uh, point was that like say it's useless to publish a book he's a philosophy faculty by the way his idea is that like all big philosophy scholars and he's just focusing on analytical philosophers and Kant scholars 
Okay. His, his area of speciality in that sense. According to him, getting published in this top journal is the, uh, what you say, uh, highest point of a career, probably. So, I mean, like, I think, it, again, and that is what was, is like, uh, we have to go from subdiscipline to subdiscipline, and I'm, I'm trying to, and this is what is a, I think is a challenge for each of us, largely working in philosophy, but within the subdisciplines, how to take this call. And since we are all at the similar stages, it's very difficult to decide what to do, whether yeah, paper yeah. or book, because each has its own peculiarity. So anyway, going, going with the system, hmm. then eyes closed, public journal articles on me. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, yeah. But uh, having said that, now this is the last question I wanted to ask. I mean, as of now, I'll come back. Uh, do you think, uh, and this is largely irrespective of what has more weightage and all, what I wanted to bring up is um, um, in this debate of whether I should publish a paper um, um, and um, publish a book, uh, the writing style, let's focus on the writing style. Do you think writing it as a paper format allows for certain things and writing for uh, in a book format allows for certain things? And what happened to you uh, in the, when we when you were focusing on converting it into a writing style of a book format? What it allowed? What you think you felt that oh, as a paper it wouldn't allow for me. Usually, usually journals come with a lot of technical limitations, isn't it? Like for example, when we go to the contributors page, so they have most of the journals right now out of purely capitalistic reasons. Sorry, I may be wrong. I may be anti-capitalist. Some of you might think like they clearly mentioned that everything included, it has to be 8,000 words. We won't take anything more than 8,000 words. But at least when we publish a book, there is a good scope for maybe elaborating your arguments or uh, uh, maybe for uh, uh, writing something extensively. Maybe the journal does not allow that, depending again on uh, uh, the journals that like sometimes it becomes very difficult to uh, make the reader understand that like it's only in the writer's head that I so wanted to explain this point, but the journal didn't allow, isn't it? Because of certain limitations. So journals usually come with their very peculiar limitations. Like I have, I have found certain journals which will neither be following Chicago style nor following APA style. They have their own styles, completely own styles. So, which most often becomes uh, maybe problematic uh, for someone who wants to write extensively. Like, again, very technical, but there are journals uh, where you can write 10,000 words, 11,000 words, and they're not bothered. And also, do you think uh, you felt that like there's a difference audience, audience to whom you are writing when you're writing a book as vis-a-vis -a, -vis a paper, because while I'm writing a paper, I know I'm I'm just speaking to four or five people in this field. I think the pressure of writing a book is that like you have to write also to a general audience who might be interested in that topic. They can pick up your book and... Yeah, this is interesting. So that, see, that, did that happen? So... Well, yeah, see, I, I, I'll give, I, again, give you an example. So since this is my position, it, uh, I am in no way arguing that my position is the only best position that is that is going to. Have. So usually that we are going to going to have. So usually we go through newspapers every morning, every Sunday, isn't it? So uh, we we'll, uh, we'll find that the, these uh, newspapers, national newspapers, they have a science column, and usually they try to give a very uh, like uh, layman language to science articles some path breaking research uh, in science, which has been published in journals. Okay. But that is never done for social sciences and humanities. When it comes to social sciences and humanities, it's about books only, isn't it? So they publish excerpts from books and they do interviews, not on uh, a particular uh, philosophers or particular thinkers journal article, but on a book that he or she has written. It's still, it's still the ongoing practice. And they don't do the same with sciences. Even if a scientist writes a book, they won't be. They will be like, no, cancer pay naya article aya hai, cancer research pay. And this is path breaking. And they'll someone among the editors will try to break it up for the audience. That's that's usually how it is. But the Sunday magazines are uh, 
filled with social science and humanities books and what those books are about sometimes an interview with the author about a book and sometimes even an excerpt from the book uh, of that particular author thanks thanks mr farhan some more questions later I think also the point that Varun is saying about how you can just write journal articles is perhaps a little more amplified in analytic philosophy, which tends to focus on slightly narrower issues and very specific problems, as opposed to I think even other areas of philosophy where uh, uh, the need to write a book is a little more. I mean, where the you need the expansiveness of the scale to be able to express your ideas, whereas in an in certain at least fields in analytic philosophy, it's very possible to just write four or five and i've seen very very established scholars who are now professors in big departments also in analytic philosophy just write a series of very i mean very influential articles but not having even written a book so i think that's a slightly that's a bit of a peculiarity to certain subfields yeah. in analytic philosophy i feel uh, but thanks for that uh, we have a couple of questions and a comment from rishab kachru uh, rishab do you want to go Hi, am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for that talk, Dr. Muzaffar. I wanted to ask, how do you balance the, well, the need to, uh, you know, how do you cater to your audience? The need to be easily understood, but at the same time, you know, not lose out on your specific arguments that you make using a certain kind of vocabulary that might be endemic or, you know, very specific to your field. That's, that's a, a bit difficult to answer because usually philosophers are the uh, most esoteric lot <laughs> in the world. Isn't it? They, they, they live in their own worlds. But at the same time, I think uh, one can easily have a very, like I, I would not use the term public philosophy, but a very public oriented approach at the same time while being intellectual in, in his language. So maybe like we can write about our work um, either uh, communicate our work through blogs, through magazines. That will that will help. And it's not just that I'm saying that that can be the only way. But that can be, in my opinion, a very interesting way because you cannot dilute the academic language uh, uh, when we are writing either a journal article or book. Because if we dilute it uh, that much, so maybe the journal will throw us out or the publisher will throw us out. So we have to balance it by carving out an interesting space where we at least create a forum where we deliberate uh, on our work in a very um, uh, like layman type of language uh, so that uh, we reach out to a uh, uh, wider audience or we have to uh, publish in uh, like institutionally established uh, public writing spaces that is an interesting medium to it, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Also, you know, uh, other forms of writing styles are not really like it's something that has been stressed upon in this talk multiple times. But other forms of writing are not really considered or con considered to be at the same level or scale, you know, as yeah, but, quote unquote uh, traditional it, forms are. But it depends on what we want. We can, we uh, like, we, uh, everything cannot be goody goody for us. So if you want to. Uh, if we want to reach out to wider audience, so we have to sacrifice, uh, like usually uh, people who write uh, newspaper columns, they are not considered serious philosophers. I know about that, isn't it? So sometimes some of us yeah, try to do, yeah. try to reach out. So we are considered dubbed as either Marxists or someone who is doing women's studies, not feminism, someone who is doing sociology, not social philosophy. But those are stigma. What to do it? We have to do, uh, like we have to just... Uh, like but we have to be clear in our minds that we have to reach out to a wider audience and i think that is essential for all of us no matter what the discipline yeah yeah otherwise i mean the way i look at it is otherwise you're just in an ecosystem whether in a university or anywhere else where you're essentially in a well a in an echo chamber where you're surrounded by similar kinds of people who are just talking in similar ways and to the larger purpose of an academic exercise or a scholarly work mm -hmm. is to engage with people out there is to make sure that the ideas whatever it is that you're working on yeah. is understood by others and if that basic requirement 
is not being met then you're just a part of a structure that is you know scratch i scratch your back you scratch mine wala yeah, scenario yeah. so we have to break uh, like create a rupture uh, in this ecosystem again giving an example one of my friends who works at a reputed iit in india he tried to organize a series of lectures in vernacular languages like he wanted that if he invites scholars they use the vernacular language uh, to reach out it didn't work out because most of the speakers were not ready that could have been an interesting yeah, way to reach yeah. out to isn't it so it was about yeah, uh, doing philosophy in kashmiri language but i i think he didn't get uh, uh, okay okay he didn't get uh, like positive inputs from the people he wanted to okay okay Otherwise, thank you thank been, you it would have been a very interesting intervention isn't it reaching out yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah thank you that's very interesting that would also means the audience is very unlike the audience you would typically ex- i mean the audience for say uh, a lecture in kashmiri or in hindi or tamil would be very different from the typical audience we would expect in a space like iit isn't it i mean it's not the, it's not the other academics i mean how, yeah, how many other yeah, academics yeah. would probably even come and yeah and interestingly very... i think in that case the project couldn't take off because the speakers themselves felt uh, uh, like uh, uneasy of what to uh, uh, how to say things in kashmiri kashmiri yeah yeah i mean yeah, yeah i agree with you we know our own mother tongues very well we may not be able to communicate technical ideas and yeah yeah yeah, yeah we should we should be able to use vernacular examples isn't it but yeah yeah, yeah. either we think that uh, we are too intellectual intellectually oriented so we don't need that or it's some something or the other but there is a weakness yeah no no or even the basic questions of i mean so, so many concepts that we just use english terms we may not know we'll, we'll again have to use the same english terms or we may not know what the corresponding terms in our vernaculars might be but i think he had kept a condition that we will not be using anything apart from the vernacular language ah, so that okay. lay, lay, yeah, lay yeah, people yeah, can okay. understand it and that so okay. and yeah, uh, if i remember because it has been more than a year <laughs> uh, i if i remember so in the invitation he had said that um, we don't need to go for like very hunky dory topics very uh, mm-hmm. high sky topics we can begin with well, like slightly more what is okay. philosophy isn't it uh, how can we understand kashmiri shaivism better how can we understand sufism better so it was okay. very lucid topics but i think um, didn't work all right uh, others dinesh yeah go go ahead please dinesh thank you uh, thank you for the talk uh, i joined in a little late so but when i joined in i heard you mentioning this that the chapters of a thesis can be published as a piece in a journal is that right uh, sorry jinesh i think your voice was a little off could you uh, okay. yeah we couldn't hear you yeah. properly yeah i'll, I'll repeat that again i i joined in a little bit late but when i joined in i heard you mentioning this that uh, a particular chapter from a thesis can be published as a piece in a journal is that right yeah and you were referring to some guideline of the ugc that letter has been shared i think siddharth shared that letter in the chat box yeah but i think that was regarding self plagiarism and other things right i mean but uh, uh is there anything specific which mentions this that we can publish a particular chapter from the thesis as a journal article as it is Yeah, anything from your thesis can be published because the thesis is an unpublished document. Okay. So that is how this letter comes in because it only talks about published. So when you you submit, we submit our thesis to a uh, university. It's not the university doesn't publish it. It is just kept in a repository. Okay. So as um, long as uh, we are done with our thesis, complete, we get our degree. Our thesis remains unpublished. it's only submitted to a university okay so it can be published as it is in the form of a paper in a journal yeah but after your phd technically speaking and not before not before that's what uh-huh. i that's yeah. what i hear uh-huh. you cannot publish it before submitting it 
Okay. Uh, I have NF, a... NF, NF it is really? technically okay. many people okay. don't follow this, but that is that uh -huh. technically it has to be done after BA. Sorry, one more. Yeah, yeah, this. go on, Jitesh. Uh, uh, and uh, what if I take out certain sections from a chapter and turn it into a paper, but it is nowhere uh, word to word similar to my chapter. Like I, I rephrase the entire content and then can I publish it before submitting the thesis? Yeah, that, that is what the UGC guidelines used to say. Now they have removed that, that based on your work, you have to have at least two published articles. So they meant something that goes parallel to your work is uh, probably part of your work. Isn't it? so that's what they meant, but now even that uh, has been removed. Now, I think for PhD, a student doesn't need publications. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Hmm. So, again, okay. not an authority, you have to confirm with the existing UGC guidelines because every every third week they change the guidelines. <laughs> yeah, Varun wanted to say, Varun. yeah, Varun had that. no, 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 I just wanted to. Uh, Add to this confusion between uh, that Jinesh has raised uh, that like I think I, the still that when I'm reading the document right now it see the thing is it says the reproduction in part or whole of one's own previously published work without adequate citation and proper acknowledgement is not is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So it's if you say that this has been published already and you acknowledge it and all of that I think that is absolutely fine. Yeah, I, that, that we can do, but I am talking about the system huh. that when you come up with a book or something where part of it is already published and you are even acknowledging that, so then the Bahubalis will say that since half of it is already published, you have yeah. already used oh, it. Okay. So then I think you and Jinesh are talking about from two different viewpoints. Yeah, you are yeah. Talking He's talking about thesis. His thesis, yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. You are talking about a faculty who's trying to. Yeah, I am talking from the faculty's perspective, not the student's perspective, because that is usually what happens. Because usually you submit the record. So, mm. it because this is what has happened with some senior colleagues here. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Madhavi has a question, I think. Uh, Madhavi says her network is bad. So, I can just read it out. She is asking, what kind of publishers do we approach before publishing our work as a book? How would you find? Reputed publishers. I think you had addressed I, that partly uh, in in the beginning. In the beginning, maybe Martin joined a little late. So, do you want to maybe repeat that for her? Yeah. So maybe it depends on the area of work that uh, we are into. So, for example, if some of us are doing classical Indian philosophy, then Motilal Banarasi Das is a good reputed publisher. DK Print World is a good reputed publisher, uh, um, and like usually when we are doing work, we come to know the reputed publishers uh, in our field. We usually come to know uh, during the process of our thesis writing. So, and globally, there are uh, uh, based in India, I think Oxford and Rutledge and maybe Bloomsbury as well. But I don't think Bloomsbury is based in India. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, which is what I was going to ask you. I mean, we see sometimes Indian authors publishing in Bloomsbury or Springer. But is that in Bloomsbury, India or Springer, India, but rather than, but uh, these publishers based out of other countries, right? Yeah, but even, even, uh, uh, I don't know about Oxford, even Rutledge uh, published the global editions from London and New York. Okay. So All right. they have different policies for that. Okay. So I think even Bloomsbury comes up with Indian editions later on. Okay. Uh, no, no, that is finally... The book as it comes out, but when you approach the publisher, do you approach, say, when you somebody in Oxford, do you approach the editors? Do they have a separate editorial team for Oxford? Yeah, India yeah, yeah. And yeah. Oxford if they have an office, office in India, they have editorial teams in India. So you have to uh, approach Rutledge India. Okay. Uh, all right. So, but some publishers such as Springer might not have such a India office, but so you'll have to approach their uh, publishers yeah, if, in if a the different publisher does not have an Indian office, so we approach. So uh, then they will revert you to the right person. That's how okay. you really work. So for okay. example, even if some of us uh, uh, don't know about the Rotledge Indian team and we reach out to their uh, global team, so they'll revert back to the right person. So, but I wonder if uh, with the editorial, I mean, 
um, is the editorial process likely to be different if you i mean for somebody in india who's going through uh routledge like india as opposed to somebody else i mean if i mean scholars might be working on very similar topics wherever in the world they are working uh is it the same kind of reviewers that uh the books are sent out to because uh no one comes to know about the reviewers mm -hmm. okay we never come to know about who the uh, the person who has reviewed the book. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah that's absolutely. completely blind. So no one knows whether they are sending it to a globally reputed uh, intellectual or an Indian intellectual. Nobody comes to know about that. Okay. All right. Others uh, questions. one if i may ask one question that i had uh, i mean i've had maybe i think partly you've answered it here is is there a very i mean what is the basic difference in the idea of thesis and an idea of a book which sort of guides everything that you write uh, yeah. for example i mean you spoke specifically about how the introductory chapter in your books book and the thesis were different but in general uh do introductions and thesis and introductions say for example in books serve different purposes uh uh this may be i mean these differences might draw i uh, from the audience you are writing for because in some sense in thesis you are writing the thesis for the examiners right yeah partly yeah, yeah. whereas the book even though there are equivalents of examiners the reviewers in some sense but you are not writing for them no you're still writing it for the scholarly community mm -hmm. so some such are there such general differences uh in what the thesis stands for and what the book stands for which sort of has implications for the style of writing and how we structure the manuscripts themselves see i think i partly uh dealt with it but i didn't uh -huh. elaborate on it usually different institutions have very different ways or very different protocols of writing a thesis for example, some institutions follow that every chapter begins with an introduction and every chapter has a separate conclusion, isn't it? Other institutions don't follow that. They, they are like you write an introduction in the beginning and the conclusion in the, in the end. So like a thesis caters largely to the institution and the department which, uh, which we are part of. But there is an established protocol for books, which is like barring a few uh notch up and notch down which is like generally globally recognized so once we turn our thesis into a book so uh, we are removing all those uh, localized uh, like protocols that are usually part of uh, the thesis so we begin either with a preface or an introduction and end with a conclusion so in between there are links from one chapter to another, but there is no conclusion for every individual chapter. For example, if, if, if we write it that way, or if we have written our thesis that way, number one. Number two, in a book, we are while we are turning it in, into a book, we are also uh, like we have it in our back of mind that we are opening the scope of this work to, a, to the global audience now, isn't it? It's You don't know who is going to read and who is not going to read. But with the thesis, at least there is a limited audience, you know, like your peer group, they hear some of your presentations, the examiner reads a bit of it, or maybe uh, uh, we don't know how much the examiner reads or how much the examiner doesn't read in India. So there, there's a very limited audience. And once you submit it, if it doesn't go to repository, I think nobody is going to read it afterwards, apart from the uh, uh, student. So this is a completely different ballgame completely different because you you are aware that what you are throwing into the world is going to go beyond your control once it's published so this is this is a more responsible job like one has to be more responsible here and that is one of the reasons that i told you that uh, i i told uh, at one point of time in the lecture that usually uh, since the uh, 
publishers are spending money on the copy editing process, they pressurize the authors to finish the copy editing process as soon as possible. But tomorrow, if there are very uh, uh, like glaring mistakes in the book, the copy editor is not responsible, the author is responsible. And I'll give you an example, a very interesting example from my book. So uh, when I was doing the copy editing, so I figured that the word public somewhere while writing, I had missed L and it had become pubic. So the public sphere was pubic sphere. So it is, it is, it's a, it's a very dangerous mistake, isn't it? So it is the author's responsibility to take time and figure out that such like, uh, uh, like it, it was like, it, it, if I um, uh, paraphrase the straight uh, sentence, so it was like, can't tell, can't uh, inspires us to use the pubic reason properly. <laughs> so so yeah. I, it, it, it's the author's risk finally. It, so it's the author. So it, we have to be more responsible because usually what has happened is that most of these processes have become automated. Uh, they, they have become like um, AI, uh, AI oriented. I think even publishers use AI, but at the end, the human hand that is only uh, the proper human hand can be the author's human hand. So the author has to ensure that such mistakes don't go into the final version of the book. And that is where time is required. And usually like if, um, um, like it doesn't, uh, we don't notice it, then we have to hear it throughout that ye to banda hai, isme to public ka pubic kar diya tha, ye kya hai, kaun sa scholar hai. It's the author's reputation and risk finally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the uh, author's reputation is at stake. Okay. Maybe the publisher says, well, but even the publisher will throw it at the author. Okay. They say that we are just publishers, isn't it? We have given it uh, to the copy editor. The copy editor has even raised queries and he has got two or three times to correct it. If he has not corrected it, it's his problem. Uh, see, Madhvi has a related question related to her previous question where she says, uh, I mean, this is more specific about the thesis. If we could copyright our thesis because it's unpublished work, uh, it's prone to being appropriated. Uh, because it's unpublished work, so there could always be fear of losing the authenticity. So is there any process by which one can preserve it for later publishing? I, I, I don't know. I know it's, I mean, but, but if it's submitted uh, and there in a repository, that it is, stands as... Yeah, that is it's a, in itself a copyright. Copyright, right? That it's your work. Mm. Yeah, Warren, Warren wants Warren, to. Yeah. No, uh, just quick response to Madhvi. Uh, Usually all universities have, uh, see, I mean, these days the UGC policy is that, of course, this is published, it has to be sent to Shodranga, right? And then it becomes a public document. Uh, what has, what was there even when I think we were all pub the, uh, putting our thesis into Shodranga, which is not strictly followed, but is being pushed now, is a embargo period, which means like when you complete your thesis, uh, you can say that my thesis needs yeah. to be embargoed for two, three years. It will be listed in Shodh Ganga, but no one can open it. In the sense, no one can have access to it. So that like it, it is there that there is a record that someone has finished their thesis, but it is not publicly accessible. So that three, you can specify in the form when you're uploading yeah, it to Shodh yeah, Ganga. Yeah. Sadly, no one is doing it seriously and this, this should be done seriously. In fact, I remember I mentioning two years as the embargo and it available, being available next day. <laughs> so it's, it's just ridiculous because like, yeah, I mean, as Madhvi says, anyone can just look it up and like say, do that. So it's a very serious thing, but yeah. I hope Shrodh Ganga is doing it seriously. But there is an option where I think we can also write back to them saying that we have mentioned two years embargo and please remove it or something like that. And quite interestingly, uh, I have submitted my MPhil way back in 2013 and it is still not there. <laughs> it can be the other way around it as well that you write, uh, you even mention that it should be and it should go, but like somewhere it goes around and then it never uh, comes on Shodhanga because that's how universities function, isn't it? Sometimes they even take four years, five years to put it up. No, no, it has now uh, gone to the ocean. From Ganga to the ocean. 
All right, others, uh, any other questions? All right, if not, uh, I think we should end the session. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Muzaffar. I think it was a very, very uh, useful and in some sense a very unique talk, uh, I think, on the process of uh, writing a book out of a thesis because this is the first of its talk that I have attended and this is partly the reason why we approached you for this. Thank you. Uh, and we look forward to the release of your uh, book. I think it's in May. Yeah, it's in May. They are saying yeah. 19th. Okay. Okay. Even though it may be the case that many of you will get it on Facebook beforehand. That's how things work. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, thanks a lot. And uh, congratulations once again thank on you. the thank you. release of your uh, book. And thank you for this lecture. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.